Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. Today I'm really excited to have Ramsey Musalam with us. Ramsey is a high school chemistry teacher who uh, is widely recognized as one of the early adopters of flipped learning and uh, speaks uh, often at conferences, has been writing books for years and sharing his passion as an educator. And we're uh, really delighted to have him with us today. Uh, so welcome, Ramsey. Thank you. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background as a teacher, as well as all these uh, awesome projects you do sharing your passion? Yeah, I uh, have been a full-time high school science teacher for the last 17 years, uh, 15 of those years at a school in downtown San Francisco, where I taught uh, chemistry and biology. Um, now I'm in my second year at Sonoma Academy High School in Santa Rosa, California, where I live with my family in Petaluma. California, and here I'm teaching chemistry, biology, robotics, and I coach our robotics team. Um, and ever since I got my doctorate in 2010, I've been investigating um, curiosity, motivation, and how technology um, intertwines with those constructs. Fantastic. Wow, robotics, that's really neat. Uh, so um, your you know, again, your name comes up a lot in flip learning circles as one of the, uh, the, the pioneers, the early adopters. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with that? Yeah, um, chemistry is a really easy subject um, to offload uh, work to video in the sense that it's very algorithmic uh, when they're first learning it. So uh, stepwise uh, video sequences end up working really nicely when helping kids solve problems. Usually a typical chemistry problem involves uh, more than one step and in something like that video instruction can be really powerful so it was a natural fit um, it's also a content domain where teachers found themselves starved for time because it takes kids a while to process the subject since they haven't seen it before it, it's the first time they have to coordinate concepts and algorithms so uh, we are in like 2006 2007 as smart boards started to hit the market um, started leveraging the, the recording feature in that software um, to do it, and it just went from there. Great, great. So yeah, that was uh, certainly the time when almost organically this idea started to appear, and uh, folks like yourself started to realize that uh, how easy it had become to, to create content like that. Um, of course, one of the challenges back then, and it comes up a bit still sometimes, particularly in more rural types of areas and socioeconomically challenged areas, um, can be access. Uh, and I imagine that that was uh, certainly a challenge for you back in uh, 06, 07. Um, how did you overcome that? Um, I overcame that by completely changing the way that I looked at it. I didn't, I never really bought into, um, if access was an issue, my personal reflective practice would say that um, I'm implementing a bad pedagogy then. Um, so I never, I, I, that's that at about that time when a lot of people started talking about those sort of issues, it really hit me that I was not leveraging video in a way that I felt was pedagogically sound. So I completely restructured not only the way I would do it, which is kind of leads me to where I am today, but the way that I would talk about it and think about it and, um, uh, blog about it. Uh, so elaborate on that. So if I understand, you're, you're saying that, you know, you did not do the traditional, here's these videos you go home and watch. Um, yeah. well, how did your approach differ from that? I did that for two years, and that's what my dissertation was on. Um, mm -hmm. I did that for a long time. Uh, students would, I mean, the working hypothesis, and this is done very well at the college level where students can be already intrinsically motivated. We've done really well at AP level, um, although I, I would still disagree with it when I taught AP. Um, I think the working hypothesis is if kids have more time to do hands-on work and be with their teacher, they're gonna learn more. Um, but I think that that's, for me, my opinion is that can, that's sort of an immature look at what learning means. Mm -hmm. Just because they have more time and they're doing it and they're doing more hands-on activities or more projects doesn't really equate to, to learning. Um, so, it, what I started thinking about, okay, so what is, what is learning? What is intrinsic to learning? And if, if I'm saying that the video itself is so important that I'm gonna put it on flash drives and burn DVDs and um, give kids wireless routers and all this kind of, this kind of stuff, 
then what I'm saying is that is the pedagogy, that that is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Like, that's taking all my energy. So um, my, my research showed statistical significance across the groups that where I was offloading the stuff to video and doing the work in the classroom, but a qualitative analysis of what was going in the classroom showed no increase in learning, uh, and definitely no increase in motivation, actually a decrease in motivation the more videos I would do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we started investigating why that was um, and really came to the hypothesis that through looking at the theoretical rationale and, and the work of the people that are doing a lot of the research in this is flip classroom is grounded in this idea that if students, it's really two things. Um, a traditional flipped classroom where you would say, okay, before I do any lecture, you're going to watch it in video, then you're going to come into class. Um, it's really grounded in two things. One, the idea that if they watch it at their own pace um, and it's segmented, that they're, the extraneous cognitive load of the information is going to be lower because they're able to interact with the video and it's more tailored, especially if it's from their teacher's voice. So they're going to take in that lecture more because it's not one on 30, it's one on one. And that sounds really appealing. And that, that can be true. Um, and then it's the idea that if they're doing the harder work in class, not at home with the teacher, because there's now more space, that they're also going to learn more. Um, and those things are true. Like if the teacher is there to do more um, with them, work through the harder problems, see them doing it, there's more formative assessment. And if they're interacting with the video, there's more... Um, uh, the cognitive load is lower, there, there's a greater chance that they're going to take in more, more information. Both of those things are true, and that's grounded in cognitive load theory, where, which is all of the research that flipped classroom research will, will, will talk about. So mm-hmm. if you look at the theoretical rationale of any flipped research thing, it's going to talk about cognitive load theory, especially mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, multimedia learning theory, particularly, which is grounded in cognitive load theory. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one thing. But... Um, Cognitive load theory has a very, very important assumption. And the assumption of cognitive load theory is that all the students are equally motivated to the task. Mm -hmm. So the assumption is that students are going to watch the video and that they're all going to interact with it. And the assumption is that when they're in class working through the problems with the teacher, that they want to be doing that. Um, So really, it's just one theory. Um, And really, what what I think the more interesting question is, how do you motivate them to the task? when they're motivated to the task and when their interest is peaked and when there is tension between what they know and what they don't know, and more importantly, when they're aware of that tension, um, then things like video can work really well. But I think the more important question isn't really where the lecture happens. So it isn't if it happens in a video or if it happens in a book or if it happens in class, it's when it happens. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the real flip in flipped learning is flipping when the lecture happens. So delaying the direct instruction to me, um, waiting for a time when students have laid down enough pathways that say, I don't freaking know this, mm-hmm. I need information. Then give them a video perhaps, or give them anything. You know, and that's what my book really talks about. Uh, yeah, so that's awesome. Um, so uh, your book, which well, I had written the title down to, uh, Spark Learning, uh, and I forget the, uh, the the subtitle, but you know, you speak to this so well, and it, it's really fascinating. Uh, you know, I've talked with a lot of early adopters, and um, so often the people that get into flip learning and start to explore this, they're doing it because they want to improve what they do. They very much have a, a passion for doing the right thing by the students and continually improving their game. And I've seen a lot of folks like yourself who it's just a starting point to then initiate some further evolution and you you speak very well to that how uh, it kind of allowed you to to get deeper and and, you know get to this underlying need Um, so um, tell us a little bit more about your book Um, yes the book is my TED talk unpackaged Um, and in my TED talk I I talk about three rules that I kind of uh, whittled down to when I um, when I was kind of doing this transition out of one way of thinking about leveraging technology into sort of a new, more universal way of thinking about how people learn and how technology can be a partner in that process or not. Um, so the, the book is really unpackaging those rules, the idea that 
uh, if students aren't curious, um, learning is inauthentic. Um, if, if students are then going to be curious about information, if you're going to really set a classroom up to be grounded by student questions, then you have to be ready for um, sort of a messy learning environment, one that isn't, uh, you know, a lot of times if you give kids a video to watch on how to solve a problem and they come to class, they're all going to solve the problem the exact same way, mm -hmm. um, which is exactly what the pedagogy set it up for. Um, and I should say that one of the reasons why this really works well at college is students have chosen to be there. So they're already, there's a level of natural entrance motivation. There's the choosing what school to go to, and then there's the, the signing up for the class on their own. Um, so by the time they get there, um, there's, a, there's more buy-in than there is by a student who's required to be there by law. So the next, and then the following thing would be when you set up an environment where students aren't all doing things the same way as they search towards their, 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 the desire for a lecture, um, there needs to be some intense reflection on the teacher's part about how to actually deliver that lecture and how to think of it as more spackle. So the book really unpackages that and it concludes by really relating inquiry learning, which is what I'm talking about, to universal themes and motivation that you'll see in movies and film. And how in, any, in anything that's designed to motivate a viewer or a hero, the mentor is never the first thing. It's always sort of couched in the middle of this journey. Um, and I like to think about the video, if I'm gonna give it to them, or the lecture as more of just a moment of mentorship. Um, and if that came at the beginning, it really would go against timeless, you know, theories of motivation that we've known forever. Uh, yeah, oh, that's really exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, you know, it's interesting that you speak about uh, college students. So I work in a college. Uh, I, my full-time role is as a CIO, um, but being at the college brought me to this fascination with teaching, and I've been teaching at, at, at the school. Uh, I teach a freshman-level class, and... Um, these students aren't quite as as motivated uh, when they come in, and uh, you know this is something I've been wrestling with a lot. That how do we get them to ask the questions? How do we get them to that point? Um, and any particular you know favorite little technique or just something you can drop in there um, that would be somewhat universal to those watching uh, about some of the ways you like to instill that curiosity and and get them to start asking those questions. Yeah, I mean I, I would say they're not mine. They're they come from the research. Research, and we know a lot more about how to spark some curiosity. There's a lot of direct measurements of curiosity now. And curiosity is, is not really like, we, we think of it, we think about it as um, just wanting to know things. But really what it is from a research perspective is the anticipation of a cognitive reward that's created by an information gap. So if a student or a person is aware and the, the awareness is the key thing. If they are made aware of an information gap, then the brain naturally is gonna anticipate the resolution of that gap. And the anticipation of that is a very, uh, you can think about it from an evolutionary perspective. The, the body doesn't like that dissonance. So it's gonna do what it needs to do to resolve it. So at that moment that the information gap is noticed, awareness is heightened. So you really can learn anything you want at that moment much better than you could if you weren't aware of that gap. So for example, I could make you aware of an information gap right now, and then I could teach you anything about any, any content domain, and you're gonna learn it better because your, your mind is heightened. It's like that tip of the tongue feeling when you can't remember the lyric to a song. At that moment, if you go and you do some math, you're gonna learn it with, well, you're gonna negotiate the complexity better. Wow. You're, you're heightened. So the idea is how do you make students aware of that? So there's a lot of things the research will talk about and the book actually, there's a whole chapter devoted to this and it's gonna walk you through the different sparks. Um, you know, one is taking something in your content domain and just removing a little bit of information, just showing an image or showing some, let's say code or showing um, a video clip and covering something up or removing the sound. Um, yeah, simple things like that are, are simple tricks that are see, all they're going to say is, well, wait, what's behind that? And then you say, what do you think's behind that? And at that moment, you have a natural thing that everybody loves to do. Um, there's no way you can't take, there's nobody in the world that doesn't want to know what's behind uh, something that they can't see. It's just yeah. a 
natural tendency. And if, if what behind that thing is related to the content domain, then what you're doing is driving them to the content domain. Um, another thing is this idea of an anticipated solution. So instead of just withholding information, you could, you could stop a scenario early. So this really works well in science where you might have a ph phenomena happening and then you just cut the video off. Um, or there might be a piece of code uh, in robotics, let's say, that doesn't have the, the resolution to it. Um, and students, the final loop might be missing or something. Um, so that works really well. And then the final one is if there's just something that is so surprising that they're going to naturally want to know how does it work. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, right now, uh, my FRC robotics team is downstairs trying to set up their pneumatics. Um, and people are walking into the room on like the other team. So the communications folks and the fabrication folks are walking in the room while the actuation people are firing off this piston. And it's so shocking how fast it goes, mm -hmm. this idea. So everyone's walking in and every time someone walks in, they go, whoa, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. So that idea right there is, you know, you know what it is. There's no information withheld. It's a cylinder, you know, it, you know, it's air, but the idea is how does it, how does it, how, how does it actually do it that way? Um, so people are gathered around watching. Um, and those are, those are three things that are all meant to, to tunnel people to the question, uh, you know, what's missing or what happens or how does it work? Um, and all of those things are windows into video instruction, if, if you will. But if you, if, if you don't do that first, then you're really just, you're really just saying my job only exists because students are required to go to my class. Right, right. You know, and, I, and a lot of people will argue with me that, well, that's their job as young people in the world to go to school. And I think that is true. But I also think we're missing an opportunity to look at what we do as an art um, if we don't take the time to say really quickly, like, if there's something you're teaching your freshman, you know, think, I challenge you to think about, like, what is something you just taught recently? Uh, so uh, digital literacy, um, you know, aware, uh, greater awareness of uh, the so many things that are happening out there on the web that are not necessarily good things um, and, and raising that awareness of yeah. how social media can be used against them and all that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff, right? So um, you could very easily, I would encourage you to think um, when you're introducing that, did you talk to them about all the examples of it? Um, and, or have them read about all the examples of it? Or did you show them perhaps a very curated image of some of a bunch of examples, a bunch of tweets where one of them was inappropriate or one, you know, and have them pick that out? Right, right. So, yeah, I've been using a balance of those kinds of things. But even as you were explaining these different techniques, I immediately went to, yeah, I could easily switch that up to more of, okay, here's this, you know, why did this happen? Or, or what is going to happen if you do this? Um, Get them to tell you. Yeah, like right, one, right. Thing, one thing I love to do is, is tell them the driving question of the course. Yep. You know, and then say, I want you guys to curate five examples, go. And right, just right. The timer on the board and the mere fact of like a, a 30 minute countdown timer is going to drive them towards it because they're curious as to whether or not they can do it in 30 seconds like and, or 30 minutes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you create tension um it's and it's not assessed in the in the in the summative assessment that tension is always super powerful that's excellent. Uh, really interesting. So, so now how, you know, as your practice has evolved and you've got, you've got all these great things going on to, you know, go after what I almost consider the holy grail, right? How do you get students to, to have that interest, to really want to learn that subject? Um, how does, you know, is the idea of flipping just still, you know, a small piece of that? Where is that fitting in the, the scheme of what you're doing? You know, At least you know, the traditional video. All my classes curriculum is, is on my website. So, if you go to cyclesoflearning.com, mm -hmm. um, and I apologize in a sec, my phone, I'm going to actually walk down to my other classroom or my computer charger. Is that okay with you? Sure. No problem. Yep. Okay. So I'm, I'm actually walking while I'm talking to you. So that's fine. Um, my, all my curriculum is public on my website at cyclesoflearning.com. And then mm -hmm. if you go to the tab at the top that says projects, mm -hmm. I kind of like to think of my classes as just projects I'm working on. 
you'll see one that says honors chemistry. That one is complete. I'm, I'm redoing my curriculum right now. And then you literally just see every single lesson plan is I'm teaching out of that Google site. So I just try and put things in front of the lecture. So you'll see, if you go there, you'll see, you know, prompts where it's like, watch this video clip or let's do this activity. And then you'll see a link that says notes and the notes always are delayed. That's it. I mean, it's, it's like, I try not to micromanage the process. Mm -hmm. um, and then that moment, you sometimes we won't have time in class to do it. So sometimes I'll record a video of it. And that's basically, and then sometimes I'll record little technical videos of things we've learned that I need them to review. Um, so for me, I would argue like, like I challenge your listeners to say, I'm, I'm, I'm using the word flip totally different to me. Flip means flipping when lecture happens, not where. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just something for people. That, that's the way I am now defining that term. Like it, it used to be putting a video in lecture. Um, or lecture and video and giving it to students, but and that I'm grateful to that like that's like you said it opened the door to a lot of things I don't discourage anybody and there's people who do are doing it really really well But for me it led to a new definition of flipped which is not where the lecture happens, but when it happens mm -hmm. so The flip for me is saying I'm going to like if you look on my website You don't see the word notes at the beginning you would you see the notes in the middle or the end Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's just it. Like I would say most classrooms you go into, the first thing that happens is I do, we do, you do, and then you do activities. Mm -hmm. My class, you, we're going to do the activities first. And we're going to do all that stuff first. And, I, and I'm doing that because I want them to not, I, I want them to get it wrong. It sounds bad, but um, really like my mission is to, is to trick kids into getting that they have to be there. And, and I think that you, you trick them, there's all this like, a lot of people want to say you trick them by making everything so engaging, and, but no one ever says what that is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think engaging, actually, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. Of it. Engaging isn't fun activities. Engaging is creating an information gap, like, and, and asking them to try and fill it. And it, it really, like, that's where critical thinking comes by putting them in positions where they have to think yeah yeah they want to answer that question in their head yeah and it, it, it is actually the most engaging thing like you look at most board games trivia I, any board game that's super engaging it's because catchphrase whatever kids are stuck in a position where they have to have an answer it's mm -hmm. not like it's engaging because there's a lot of bells and whistles and like ladders and stuff right you've got to figure something out yeah yeah because mm -hmm. you have to figure something out and it doesn't mean and that doesn't have to be an academic nerdy thing that's just like the way the mind works, mm -hmm. literally. So, oh, that's, that's, that's great. Really uh, so, you know, what's, what's next for you? What do you, what, how, uh, as you continue to evolve, uh, what's on the immediate horizon? Anything in particular? Yeah, um, you're thinking about? So I love the school that I'm teaching at right now. I'm in my robotics studio right now. You can see it's really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and sitting here in beautiful Santa Rosa, California, we're just recovered from all the fires and everything and everything's good. Yeah. Um, I love it here. I'm just a full-time teacher. Uh, and that's it. That, that's what I want to do. Um, and I try and share that stuff with other teachers um, as much as possible. Um, and that's really it. Like, I got four kids, so. Four? Good Lord. God yeah, bless you. So they have to come first. And mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I, I was traveling a lot after Ted doing a lot of speaking, um, but that was taking me away from the family too much. So mm -hmm. now I'm just trying to be in the classroom and be the best teacher I can be. I mean, I'm redoing my curriculum and trying to learn more. Um, I still feel like I'm a crappy teacher. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to figure out how to be better. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, and I hear that so often from, from teachers like yourself that, you know, I'm just nowhere near where I want to be. I want to keep yeah. getting better. And, yeah. and I think that's really uh, admirable and, and it makes it fun. And I, I use the same approach in my, uh, in my life too. Um, so uh, people can find you online at cyclesoflearning.com. Yep. Um, how about your Twitter uh, handle? It's, uh, you'll see a link to it at the top there. It's at R.A. Musalem. Okay. Um, yeah, but it'll be, if you go to cyclesoflearning.com, you'll see the social media links right there at the top. You can subscribe to the newsletter, um, and I'll send some stuff out once in a while, ideas, lessons. 
Um, you could buy the book from the website. There's, um, in the, I'm in the process of putting together some online courses. Uh, those will be there under the course tab. Um, yeah, and that's it. Excellent. Well, I will share those links uh, in the video, and I encourage people to go out to uh, Amazon or to your site and look for Spark Learning, the book. And thank you again so much for your time. It was really great to talk to you. Will this be on YouTube or just? Yes, it will. Yep. Okay. Can you send yep. me the link when it's on? Sure. Yeah, it'll, it'll be up on the Flip Learning site, fliplearning.org, and then it um, delivered through YouTube. Okay. Thank you. All right. Take care.